Now, I don't know, I have never met my candidate, and for that reason, I am more apt to say something good of him than anyone else. I was asked to do this by one of the Roosevelt boys. You know that nobody ever could refuse Roosevelt. Now, I find a peculiar case in my candidate. Most people take up policy through necessity or as a last resort. But I find this guy was wealthy before he went in. Not as wealthy as he is now, but still, he was rich. Perhaps he, that's what he went in for, to protect what he had. As they say there's honor among them. His principal political handicap is that he was educated at Harvard. But I understand he has forgotten most of that, so that uh, brings him back to earth. Hello and welcome to the Town Hall. Today is but one installment in a series entitled Century of Story and Song. The Town Hall was founded in 1921 by a group of suffragists who wanted the space to be a home to adult education, consciousness raising, and civil discussion. Over the course of the next hundred years, many people came to the hall, many musicians came to the hall, and made the hall's acoustics world renowned. Isaac Stern, Nina Simone, Bob Dylan, and many more made important debuts that changed the course of music history. Today, we continue our four-part series on the little-known history of comedy at the Hall. Comedians came to the Hall, including Will Rogers, the subject of tonight's program. Here with us today, we have Ben Yagoda, the author of Will Rogers, A Biography. His books include About Town, The New Yorker, and The World It Made, Memoir, A History, and The B-Side, The Death of Tin Pan Alley, and The Rebirth of the Great American Song. He is currently a Guggenheim Fellow working on a book on O. Henry's years in New York. Yagoda lives in Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for joining us, Ben. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Well, first of all, I just have to ask, that's a pretty wide range of subjects. Um, how did you start in academia? What was the first uh, you know, pull? Well, um, I started in academia kind of late in life. Uh, for a number of years, I taught uh, journalism and writing at the University of Delaware. But from the very get-go, I was interested in writing, journalism, started out in magazines, and actually, um, round about 25, 30 years ago, I was just itching to do a book. And I, uh, my favorite kind of magazine article to do was a profile, an article about a person. Um, and uh, so I said, let me do a biography, okay? Mm. And, um, that was the genre, but who, who to do? It seemed like all the good people had been done already. So there was about a year, year and a half, two year period when every time any name would come up, I would look and see, A, was the person interesting to me? Uh, B, had there been a biography? C, could I possibly interest a publisher? And there were a number of false starts and ones that didn't work out, but the name Will Rogers popped in one day. I knew nothing about him. I uh, had a vague image that he twirled a, a rope and that in theaters at odd times, people would come around with cans asking for donations to the Will Rogers Fund. Um, so I, I was intrigued. And the more I found out about him, the more interested I was for some of the reasons we'll get into. And so I, I on my own dom, I went out to the Will Rogers Memorial in Claremore, Oklahoma, which is where uh, all his papers and all the material associated with him is. And I recommend anyone go there. It's a great museum. And so the, the curator there let me poke around and I found this black loose leaf binder that said, 
on the back of it, uh, letters from famous people to Will Rogers. <laughs> and I just sat down and started paging through it. And, you know, Helen Keller and Charlie Chaplin and Bernard Baruch had written letters to him. And there was one from Charles Lindbergh. And it said something to the effect of, Dear Will, I'm glad to see that you're flying the air. Uh, just make sure to keep out of single engine planes at night. Sign Charles. Um, I knew enough about Will Rogers at that time, spoiler alert, to have known that a few years after that, he would die in an accident in a single engine plane. Mm. And that just seemed karma. I got to write this story. And, 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 and I went ahead and did it. And that, that was the first um, book I did and, and one of my favorites. And uh, I, I love talking about Will Rogers. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I want to start um, at the beginning his, of his life. Uh, I don't think people necessarily know his origin and of course his cultural heritage. Could you just speak about that? Sure. Uh, you know, I think nowadays my book's efforts, notwithstanding, people still don't know too much about him. And as you say, certainly not his origin. He was born in what's now Oklahoma, was then Indian Territory in 1879. Um, his, both his mother and father were roughly one quarter Cherokee, and he identified as, as a Cherokee in the Cherokee Nation. Um, his father, Clem, you know, it's interesting, in the uh, in the speech that we're going to talk about at Town Hall, uh, the clip we just heard, uh, he talks about uh, he was invited to give the speech by one of the Roosevelt boys, which was Kermit Roosevelt, son of Theodore Roosevelt. And later on in the speech, he talks about him as a big man. And his father, Clem, was a big man. He was a wealthy landowner, cattle rancher, uh, a prominent member of the tribe, a prominent member of the territory. He and Will clashed quite a bit. Um, Will in school didn't get along. Will in rules didn't get along. He wanted to be a cowboy just when the range was kind of closing up. But throughout his life, he always responded to, to prominent people, to big men. Um, and and I, I definitely see some of his relationship to his own father in that, his ambivalent uh, love-hate relationship to the father. So yeah, he, he uh, wanted to be a cowboy. Um, range was closing up, didn't get along with his father. So he went to Argentina where he had heard <laughs> there was still an open range on the Pampas. And uh, he had mixed luck there, didn't really land the kind of job he wanted. And I'm, I'm moving fast ahead in his life, so cut me off mm -mm. anytime you like. But um, he, he ended up on a ship to South Africa where I guess he had also heard there, were, there was cattle ranching. Um, but there, his career took a momentous turn. Um, there was a Wild West show running through, and one of the skills that he had learned back in Indian Territory was rope spinning. So he hired on as a trick rope twirler, lariat twirler, in this Wild West show in South Africa. And, um, you know, the rest is history. Uh, his whole life after that was show business, no more, no more cattle. Well, that's a question that I have as well, because I don't know much about um, the cattle to entertainment pipeline, I should say. <laughs> right. But, you know, were there already famous ranchers? Like, was there already a vaudeville scene or just like a traveling theater scene that included yeah. Westerns? And stuff well, like absolutely. It was all starting around that time. I mean, the, the most famous Wild show, a Wild West show is, I, I bet, now that I'm saying it, you can tell me who I'm about to say. Buffalo Bill? Buffalo Bill. That ring yeah, a bell? Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and Zach Mohall. And they were set, just as the, as the frontier was ending, the range was closing, there was a fascination, really, for all things Western. Mm -hmm. 1905, which was Will Rogers' debut in vaudeville, the most popular bestseller was The Virginian by Owen Wister. Oh, um, right. The Great Train Robbery, Western movies were already starting. There was this fascination with the West. And so when he got, when, when Will got back to, to the States, he joined this Wild West show. 
the, the Mull Hall show, which recall was kind of second to the Buffalo Bill one. Um, they played the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, and then they played Madison Square Garden in New York City. Um, and once Will got a taste in New York City, that was it. The, the, the show went back home to the West. He stayed. And you mentioned the area he went into, which was vaudeville. By 1905, vaudeville was at the peak of its popularity. It was kind of the Ed Sullivan show before there was an Ed Sullivan show. It was variety entertainment. So whether it was a strong man or a singer or a comedian or a dog act or a rope twirler, <laughs> there was, you know, 15 acts on the bill. And, um, and Will got 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 a job fairly quickly and became successful in vaudeville uh, fairly quickly. And in that period, 1905 to the early teens, traveled the country as a vaudeville entertainer. Now, what would be in his vaudeville act? Was it jokes and the lasso? Was he, you know, because he's in New York, very metropolitan, very sort of urbane, was part of the entertainment that he was a fish out of water? Absolutely. He, he was he was the hayseed and he played that up. He was, you know, as smart as can be, but he knew how to play his persona. But um, yeah, when the act started out, it was what's called it was what's called a dumb act. And that doesn't refer to intelligence, but refers to not saying anything. So the strong man, the magician, uh, the rope twirler would just do their thing. And at first he actually had a horse and a rider with him. They would go mm -hmm. on stage and they would, I don't know if gallop is the word, I don't know how fast you can gallop across the stage, but they would proceed across the stage and he would rope first the rider, then the horse, then the horse and the rider. Mm -hmm. And um, But very quickly, and I was able to dig up the clippings of the early reviews of his act just in the first months he was doing vaudeville, um, he started talking. Uh, <laughs> and... The, the reason for starting talking was when he would make a mistake, which would happen. Um, it was almost like when Johnny Carson would have a joke that didn't go over very well. His follow to that was got bigger laughs than the initial thing. So his remarks, people just cracked up. He, he was a, a funny person, a great entertainer, a great communicator. So over that year, those years of eight or nine years that he was in vaudeville, the percentage of talking to roping went from, uh, you know, 1% to 99% to 90% talking, 10% roping. You know, he would mm -hmm. he would just sort of tell his jokes and bring the lariat on and, and twirl it around a little bit just for kind of punctuation. So that was the transition of his <laughs> act. And, you know, what is the... He's taking this across the country, right? So people are seeing him the same way they saw all other sorts of vaudeville acts that, you know, crossed the country, went to different fairs. Um, when does Hollywood come calling or does he go? Well, um, yeah, so there's one important thing in between um, in his career. Uh, there was the vaudeville years. And then in the early teens, he was spotted by a man named Florenz Ziegfeld, uh, famous right. for the Ziegfeld Follies. And this was the, it was sort of the, 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 the height of vaudeville. Um, it was classy. It was sophisticated. It had a lot of beautiful girls that it was mm -hmm. known for. And it traveled around a little bit, but mostly stayed put in New York City. And um, so the greatest entertainers of the day, uh, Fanny mm -hmm. Bryce, Eddie Cantor, W.C. Fields, Will Rogers, were in the Ziegfeld Follies. And that really gave him a national platform and national fame. And um, by that time, I'm pretty sure th there was no rope at all. He might have just brought it on as something to hold. But, but actually, he, he didn't. Because um, in, in vaudeville, they would go from city to city to city. So his act remained exactly the same because the people the next night had no idea what he said the previous night. When he was staying put in New York City, he couldn't do that. They were repeat customers. They expected something new. And that was when, instead of bringing the rope on stage with him, he brought the newspaper and started commenting on the events of the day, because every day was different. Um, 
And that was where he came up with one of his two most famous lines. And by the way, if you see a list of Will Rogers quotes on the internet, mm -hmm. uh, 98% of them are fake. They didn't, <laughs> he didn't say it. Somehow the tradition became that anytime someone comes up with a thing they think is clever, they attribute it to either Will Rogers, Mark Twain, or George Bernard Shaw. It kind of goes around. But um, one thing he really did say was, all I know is what I read in the papers. So he mm -hmm. would say that, say, here's a headline about Wilson at this international conference, then just go off to the races on that. So he became a national figure at the Ziegfeld Follies. And, um, you know, one of the remarkable things about him, uh, because he had this country, hazy, down-home persona, which was, wasn't, it wasn't a fake, he played it up, though, um, he was incredibly sophisticated about a lot of things, one of which was technology. So in this period of the early 20th century, there would be one new medium would appear after the other. And somehow Will Rogers jumped on basically all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one was the silent pictures. And Samuel Goldfish, who would later change his name to Samuel Goldwyn, uh, <laughs> knew of his work from the Ziegfeld Follies, hired him. And he, for the uh, late teens to the mid 20s, 1925, 1926, he had a pretty successful um, career as a silent film actor. Um, it never quite took off because, as people might have heard in the clip, he was a talker. His vaudeville was about talking. Uh, he later was a big hit on the radio, <laughs> on the lecture circuit. It was all him talking. So the fact that in a silent film he was able to have any success at all was, you know, a, tri a tribute to him and the people he worked with. Um, but sure, he he was he was one of the silent film stars of the day. Well, a question I have, because he is so associated with, um, you know, his one-liners, um, was when he really started writing officially. Because uh, uh, obviously you are writing when you are doing a stand-up set, for example. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he's also written a lot. Right. And he had a column. Right. When did he start formalizing that writing practice? Well, you know what? It's, it's so interesting because... He was, you know, he had his fingers in, in all sorts of pots and, and did a little bit of writing here and there. I mean, he certainly wrote his 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 act down. And in, in Claremore, there's a copy of his act where he re even writes down, make a mistake here, miss this and say this. So he, he, he wrote. But what really got him started, and we didn't plan this, you and I, yeah. was this town hall speech, which came in 1922. He was a folly star. Um, Roosevelt asked him to give a speech. He, as you heard in the clip, he knew nothing from Miss Ogden Mills. He had never met him. He basically insulted him. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the line that was in the clip, which was so great. Um, so Ogden Mills was a Republican congressman from the so-called Silk Stocking District of the Upper East Side of New York, the wealthiest neighborhood in New York. And he was a wealthy guy, went to Harvard. And so Roger says in this, in the clip that we heard, um, this guy was wealthy when he went in. Not as wealthy as he is now, <laughs> but still rich. You know, and he said, there's honor among them. Congress are thieves. That, yeah. That's sort of the premise. And the fact that he was rich when he came in, uh, he was able to, to, to increase his wealth more <laughs> while being a member of Congress was just this kind of subtle little dig that, that Rogers was able to do. And, and you know, the, the clip we heard, um, I don't know if listeners uh, were struck by this, but what struck me was that the utter silence. Okay? Mm -hmm. Lines were pretty funny. Why wasn't, why didn't we hear laughter? Well, mm -hmm. the reason was that, and I see there's the, the clip from the New York Times up there now. This speech made such a sensation that A, the New York Times didn't have a reporter there. They asked him to come to the office and say the speech again so they could take it down and write an article about it. 
And then later, the Victor Recording Company, another new technology, uh, records um, were started. Okay, and there's one from the billboard. Yeah, yeah. Um, records was starting to come in. They asked him to come in and just in a studio give this and other speeches, and that's what we heard him speaking to a microphone in a recording studio, reproducing his town hall speech. Um, so, uh, but but it, it, there are some clips on YouTube, including once uh, 1932 at a rally for. Uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, where you can see Will Rogers interplay with the crowd. And it's, mm. it's really wonderful. He, he plays off them, his pauses, their laughter. Uh, he's just a master communicator. Um, so I recommend that people check out those clips on YouTube. Yeah, there's some good stuff on YouTube of him, which you wouldn't necessarily expect to find given how long, those, how long ago those recordings were released. Right, right. But, you know, my question is, you know, he's been doing this work since the turn of the century. Um, how famous is he by this date, 1922? Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I now realize I didn't ask, answer your previous question. It was very nice of you not to point that out. How did he get into writing? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it, it was the same speech. It was this town hall speech made such a sensation that within the year, uh, he is writing a daily column mm -hmm. for the New York Times and what eventually became 400 newspapers around the country. And it was called Will Rogers Telegram. So it was short. It was just two or three paragraphs. But the New York Times put it on a prominent place. Um, I believe he was their first signed columnist, you know, like the Paul Krugman or Maureen Dowd of today. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the start of his writing career. Uh, about five years later, in the late 20s, he expanded into a weekly Sunday column that was quite long, like 1,500 words, and really kind of wonderful. Um, the, all his writings um, are in print. The University of Oklahoma Press put them in print. And if um, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend someone spend their hard-earned money to, uh, to to purchase one of these. But if you're ever in a library, a good library, if libraries are open and, and you come across the uh, weekly articles of Will Rogers, dip around in them, and it's some it's some really good stuff. He, he was a wonderful writer. Well, something that we see, I mean, we haven't stopped seeing, but definitely in Hollywood and entertainment generally is types, you know, archetypes and sort of folk characters who keep showing up across time. Um, and, you know, the, the 1920s in film didn't lack those. There's, you know, Valentino and um, Garbo's The Mysterious Lady. Um, but in terms of American folk culture, Will Rogers really is something specific to the American idea of the West. Can you talk about him as a mythological, cre not creature, but <laughs> mythological yeah. being? Boy, if, if he heard the word mythological, it'd fly to him. <laughs> he would go to town on that. Oh, gosh. He, he was, uh, he would have really, really balked. But, but, it, but you're, you're right. Um, and I think you used the word archetype. And, you know, it, it wasn't anything planned, but I, in addition to his skill and his humor and his uh, his rope spinning ability, you know that was really a part of why he struck such a chord. Um, you know, I mentioned his line. Um, uh, All I know is what I read in the papers. His other famous quote is, and definitely a bit of hyperbole. I never met a man I didn't like. Um, which was poetic lesson because there were lots of people who didn't like, but it bespoke this kind of uh, open-hearted, uh, uh, good-hearted uh, quality he had. And when he died uh, in that plane crash, it, it really shocked the nation. Um, you, you also asked about his fame. And that's something that, that cumulatively grew through the late teens, the 20s, um, the other thing that the town hall speech led to was his career as a speaker. Um, he started being the most in-demand after-dinner speaker. Then he went on the road for two, three years, a different town every night, 
wasn't vaudeville. It was just him. And he had some singers as an opening act. But he would just stand on the stage and talk for an hour and a half, two hours, um, <laughs> until he would be at the end be dangling his feet on the end of the stage and say, you know, I know you need to go home. You can kick me out. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll stay here all night. Um, so, and then through the talking pictures, which is, you know, those movies haven't uh, aged so well. They're a little dated, but they were incredibly popular at the time. 1933, he was the number one box office attraction in the country, ahead of Clark Gable, Mae West, uh, Shirley Temple, everybody. Um, so when he died, it was really a shock to the system of the country. And there was one quote in, in an obit that uh, I came across in my research that really, I, I remember to this day, it, he said, uh, the, the writer said, Will Rogers is the kind of American Americans think or would like to think other Americans are like. So mm -hmm. he, <laughs> he was kind of the, the, the positive side to, to the national characters, generous, funny, uh, unassuming, self-effacing, uh, sharp, witty. Um, he had a lot of those archetypal American characters, he, and he really did. Uh, you know, he, it was, he was a performer and he performed that persona but it was by no means false or a fake. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a part of him. Well, you talk about him continuing to go on lectures and that being actually a huge part of you know, who he is and of course how he spent his time. So when he came to the town hall for um, the campaign event, he's brought by Kermit Roosevelt, whose brother actually laid the first stone for um, the town hall. Really? Yeah, um, Theodore Jr. Um, but when he came back, he came back as a part of Town Hall's own programming from the League for Political Education, which, of course, as many of our viewers know, was a suffragist organization found in 1896 mm. that went on to build the hall. But I mean, the kinds of names that they had coming in for their own events, like, you know, Bertrand Russell and Rabin de Graaf Tagore and, you know, just huge, huge intellect. But boom, here's Will Rogers yeah. in, you know, 1927 um, with a speech that it sounds very anti-interventionist. Right. You know, um, I, I was happy to learn about this because I didn't know about it. Um, and you sent me some of the clippings about it. I did not know. But one thing I'll say is they must have had a good budget because by this time his fee must have been very, very hefty. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you know anything about what they would pay? For no, I, yeah. I don't know. I can find out though. Yeah. I can find out. It would be I'll interesting. And yeah. So, um, I mean, w one of the things about Will Rogers is I I've said all these great things about him. Um, and, and he was really great on national politics. He saw through people, um, he was sharp, uh, the issues of the day prohibition, when there was demagoguery or fakery, and when the when the depression came around, he was very hard hitting uh, against the lack of action that that Hoover did. Uh, was big fan of Roosevelt. Um, he was not a great thinker on foreign affairs, um, as you said. The general tenor was anti-interventionist, maybe isolationist. Um, uh, sort of some, you know, in reading the talk, uh, the the account of that speech, some kind of cheap, cheap cracks, um, yeah. what was very much, you know, from his frontier upbringing, hated the idea of debt. So wanted all our war debts to be paid. Um, probably the, the most uh, uh, unfortunate position he ever took was uh, he started traveling around the world in the 20s and uh, on assignment from the Saturday Evening Post and a series called Letters from a Self-Made Diplomat. And, you know, he would make some good observations here and there, um, but he was taken in by Mussolini. Yeah. Uh, he thought Mussolini was a big man. Uh, he was kind of charmed by him. There's in, in Will Rogers Memorial, there's a signed photograph of a Mussolini riding a horse signed to Will Rogers. And of course, this was in the 20s and his Mussolini's uh, policies and abuses had not come to the fore yet. But mm -hmm. at that point, um, 
Will Rogers was a fan. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. He died in 1935. Uh, I wonder if he would follow yeah. uh, Lindbergh and, and be an isolationist in America first year. I, I kind of think not, but I'm biased. I'm a, I'm a Will Rogers fan, so we, we don't know. Um, the world changed so rapidly uh, in the years after his death that it's, it's, it's only speculation uh, where he would have stood. Yeah, I mean, I was curious about that as well because of what it was reported he said at this event, um, which of course is funny, but if I can read this, um, Mayor Rogers, as he was <laughs> referred well, to. Uh, let me just explain that. The <laughs> yeah. reason for that is that he was uh, the honorary semi-official mayor of Beverly Hills, California, which was <laughs> where he lived. And the city as a publicity stunt uh cooked up this idea that Will Rogers would be mayor. So th this was around the time that had happened. So that was a, a thing in the news at that point. No, I love it. I think it's so funny. Um, so yeah, the, the last paragraph of the New York Times uh, review, uh, Mayor Rogers describes his recent trip to Rome and his interview with Mussolini. I stood in the Roman Forum and I found out that they had a Senate in Rome long ago, he said. That's why Rome declined. Boy, if they declined with a Senate, what will we do with a Senate and a House? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, one liner, pretty funny, uh, you know, uh, in terms of its observation about what was going on in Italy at the time, n nothing, you know, not, yeah. not, 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 uh, uh, not profound in, in any way, shape, form. It, it was a gag, and uh, he 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 was at times just just a gag man. Do you think that some of his limitations when it comes to looking at the world outside of the United States um, comes from him always referring back to the United States? So when he goes to see Mussolini, is he constantly thinking about and sort of? Um, digesting what he sees and hears through the lens of his own upbringing? Um, well, I guess so. Kind of the way we all would, um, or most of us would. You know, he was, I guess he wore many hats. Um, and sometimes it might have been a little awkward putting one on and taking the other off. And which one is he wearing at the time? So he was a gag man, but he was a foreign correspondent and he was a political commentator. And... Uh, sometimes he took these things seriously, but mm -hmm. other times he took the, uh, the easy way out. Uh, so, you know, in terms of being a uh, sophisticated, subtle commentator on foreign affairs, that just was not <laughs> something that was going on. And yeah. when it came to that, he, he retreated to, to gags. Mm -hmm. American politics, I think from... His, his upbringing with his father and the politics of the Cherokee Nation and Oklahoma Territory were very uh, active and subtle and involved. And, and he was he had a great nose and ear and, and eye for what was going on in Washington um, and was really interested in it and knew all the players. When it got outside the country, um, not so much. Well, I, I do want to just look at a short clip um, from a silent film uh, that he stars in, because I think it's um, kind of interesting that this man of so many words, as you said before, is like so known for his voice, so known for well known for his writing, um, does so well silently as well. And is such a, a captivating um you can tell he comes from vaudeville. You can tell he uses his body to, to make um, jokes and also to make poetry. So let's look at a clip from the Cowboy Shake.
<laughs> I was waiting for when the roping would come in, and I'm, I'm glad it finally. Uh, you know, uh, on that topic, uh, another film he made, um, a silent film called The Ropin Fool, R O P I N apostrophe Fool, I believe is in public domain on YouTube, and it's kind of a, a showcase for his tricks. And I'd recommend people check that out as well. Oh, but wonderful. yeah, the silent, silent Will Rogers. Hmm. Well, for anybody watching, uh, Cowboy Shake is uh, in public domain, as are his silent films from before 1922, I think, at this point. But definitely this one is as well, from 1924. Right, right. But yeah, I mean, uh, it's so interesting. I think American cinema, perhaps as opposed to others, um, is really noted, um, especially at the beginning of the form, for its use of vaudeville actors and mm. great physical performers. So, you know, like even Cary Grant was like kind of in a circus. <laughs> you know? Well, Buster and, Keaton uh, comes to, and Ch Chaplin, Chaplin as well, both came out of music hall. Um, Will Rogers was a friend of Buster Keaton's father, Joe Keaton, and they were in vaudeville together. And Buster Keaton uh, started out in vaudeville and was famous for being a little kid that would be just thrown around the stage um, mm -hmm. to the point where the child welfare advocates would come in and periodically arrest his parents for doing that. And yes, yeah, so if you compare Will Rogers in the clip we saw to a Buster yeah. Keaton or a Chaplin, it's not quite the same thing. But as you said, he does have, uh, you know, the, the physical comedy, the way he would kind of shrug his shoulders and, um, follow along uh he, he he was good he was good at physical comedy not his strongest mm -hmm. suit but he was good no i just i look at him and i just see so much uh charisma mm -hmm. that you know uh obviously goes beyond words we couldn't see anything or hear anything rather right right mm -hmm. um but okay so he's a huge star in the 1920s uh he really was a huge star in you know before the 1920s but he's massively um massively popular and he's working in different mediums at this point. He's still mm -hmm. making films. He's writing a New York Times column. He's on lecture tours. What else did this man do? Well, the radio. The okay. radio, so the radio okay. came in and he was uh, uh, one of the top five, top 10 radio programs in the early 30s. And the format, guess what? He would sit in the studio and start talking. <laughs> and keep talking. And his gimmick was that it was an hour long show. So he had an alarm clock set to ring at one hour. And when it rang, he would stop, even if it was the middle of a sentence. And that would be the show. And it was a huge hit. People loved it. Um, so yeah, he was the he was the king, king of all media. The 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 um, he was signed by the Fox Company in 1929, shortly after talking pictures started. And he was predictably a bigger hit in talking films than in silent films. Um, you know, uh, one thing I was never able to find out in, in researching the book was exactly why, like when I was a kid watching TV, uh, W.C. Fields, the Marx Brothers, um, lots of early uh, film comedies were on TV all the time, never Will Rogers. And it was partly a matter of just it was so remote um, from that era. Things had changed so much. His homespun humor didn't go over as well as a Marx Brothers or a Fields. But uh, partly Fox, for reasons I never was able to find out, didn't make them available. So he made, uh, I think, roughly between 25 and 30 talking films. And uh, they just weren't on TV. And... Um, not sure why. A couple of them made it into the public domain, like Judge Priest, that would be shown, directed by John Ford, and they were great friends as well. Um, but his films really haven't been seen um, since the time they came out in the, in the late 20s and early 30s. And truth to tell, uh, as I think I mentioned earlier, they have, not, they have not aged very well for the most part. Uh, There's some good moments, but they, they come across as, as rather dated. Well, you know, I watched some of uh, Judge Priest and we could get into a co whole conversation of just that era in film comedy. Um, 
but you know, minstrelsy and um, minstrelsy and sort of what he's doing seem to happen around the same time. Um, and they kind of seem to collide in that film, or not collide, but coalesce actually mm -hmm, in that mm -hmm. film where there's this kind of Western folksy um, humor being employed. But also, I mean, the man who would place, was it, it was Step and Fetch It? Step and Fetch It, yeah. You know, is in there. So there's that legacy also of minstrelsy. And these two um, comedic art forms um, having really come out of the 19th century and also the social and political upheaval, yeah. of course, um, after the Civil War. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, one thing I'll say is that he um, became very good friends with, with, with Stephen Fetcher, who's, I, I'm embarrassed to say, I don't remember his real name. Stephen Fetcher was his uh, stage name. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, but I, it escapes me at the moment. Um, and I have a photograph um, of uh, on the set um, of 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 Rogers, uh, Stephen Fetchett, a couple of the other African American actors in the film, and, and a couple of the Caucasian actors sitting around a piano. And John Ford is there as well, and they're all singing together. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if he if it was a uh, a rehearsal for a scene or just an impromptu thing, but it's it's a very moving uh, photograph. Um, just the, the respect, uh, mutual respect that that I see in it, um, uh, and, and the music. So uh, I think I think that photograph is in my book, uh, Will Rogers, a biography. Well, um, something that also came to me while watching that or rather researching after. So I was like, what is happening here <laughs> a little bit while watching it um, was that there may have been scenes that were cut out um, that were actually rather racially progressive and that the, the cast was expecting that. And then it was cut out in order to appease uh -huh. censors. So I want to look more that. into that because that, that sounds right, especially for Will Rogers. Yeah, I'm gonna um, look into it as well. I mean, he was a man of his time. Um, his father fought for the Confederacy mm -hmm. uh, in World War II, uh, excuse me, in the Civil War. Um, uh, but but, 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 but <laughs> he, he was someone who tried to do the right thing. Um, so to some extent broke out of, of that of that time, um, not completely, but but to some extent. I see there's uh, a question. question. Yeah, I, we have a can good I address question. that? Yeah, yeah let, me, let me read it out loud, loud. Michael Tisser, great event. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, did Will Rogers pioneer the idea of making comedy from the day's newspaper stories that would later become the mainstay of talk show monologues? And would he bring a newspaper on stage? And uh, interestingly enough, last week as the second night of our comedy series, we talked about Dick Gregory, who has a new um, documentary out about him on Showtime. And Dick Gregory actually did that. Would take, bring a newspaper. Yeah, he would take a newspaper and out. So and so did Mark Saul. You know, Dick Gregory. Was his friend. Mark yeah. Saul, yep. uh, well, uh, first of all, Michael Tisserand is the gentleman and he's a... Oh, Tisserand, uh, excuse me. Yes, he, he's a noted author of uh, Crazy, the biography of George Harriman, creator of Crazy Cat. And the answers to his two questions are yes and yes. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, the, the word, listening to the clip on the, on the Ogden Mill speech was, he kidded, <laughs> he kidded these politicians um, in much the way that Mort Saul, Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, et cetera, et cetera, would do. And he started that. He started the kidding vein in American humor. Um, and absolutely, all those people came out of him. And yes, indeed, he would bring the newspaper on stage. Um, and that was his prop. And start off with the line, all I know is what I read in the papers. Start in that article, that article, and you'd be off to the races. So for sure. But, you know, we were talking about this the other day. I was um, at the Museum Moving Image last week, and they have that entire wall of headshots of, you know, actors from the classic era of Hollywood, um, really the 50s and earlier. Uh, and I see a Rogers, I see Rogers' name, and I look up and I'm like, that's not Roy. 
<laughs> can you speak to us about Roy Rogers and um, his relationship and appreciation of um, of the Rogers we're talking yeah. about? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I mentioned that when I was a kid growing up in the '60s, uh, the, Will Rogers was just not a, a figure. Roy Rogers was uh, a cowboy with his his wife Dale Evans. Um, uh, was a cowboy star. Today, probably they're equally obscure, but uh, Roy Rogers w was a big star at the time. Um, he uh, started out as a, a musician. He was in a, a group called the Sons of the Pioneers in the 30s. Um, his real name was Leonard Sly. But when he was hired to make movies, um, that uh, didn't seem like it would be a great name for the a marquee. So he took the name Rogers in honor of Will Rogers. Um, uh, Lou Roy was suggested for a first name, but he didn't think that was manly enough, so he settled on Roy. So Roy Rogers named himself after Will Rogers. Incredible. Um, but you know, you, you talked about Mort Saul and all of these great comedian stand-ups who took the newspaper to the stage and you know really talked back and 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 played with or kitted um, politicians. I wonder about his you know stage his stage act beyond that sort of like the vaudeville character he had developed the film character that he had developed. Who do you see as the children of that Will mm. Rogers? You know. Um... Really, the, the, the political stuff, Johnny Carson, Jay Leno, Mort Saul, uh, Stephen Colbert, uh, that's, that's where I see his, um, his lineage. Um, the other aspect of him, the, the home spot, <laughs> down home, aw shucks, just folks, that's not something that's, that we see too much of nowadays. That's kind of gone you know, gone with the ages. Um, so I, I don't see that aspect of his of his persona carried on today. Do you think that there was any sort of relationship between that character that he, you know, cultivated and the rise of certain stars like Henry Fonda or Jimmy Stewart and, you know, sort of that pure yeah, American yeah. ideal? You know, I, I never really thought of it, but I think I think you're right. I think that's a great point. It, probably not consciously, mm -hmm. but that 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 sort of you know good side of the American character that, as you say, the Fonda um, uh, Stewart persona really built on. I, I think that he, he was part of the foundation of that. I, I do think that's correct. You know, speak of Henry Fonda. Um, John Ford directed uh, Will Rogers in three films in the 30s, including his last film, Steamboat Round the Bend. And, and they were great friends. And Ford was a great admirer of Will Rogers. When he made The Grapes of Wrath mm. um, with Henry Fonda later on, after Will Rogers' death, there's a lingering shot of the Will Rogers Highway. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, in, in Oklahoma with this sort of unspoken idea that this is part of the country, that uh, an aspect of the country that, that is being lost. Um, mm. I, and I'll also say that another son of Oklahoma, Woody Guthrie, uh, yeah. was asked who he admires the most. And he said two people, Jesus Christ and Will Rogers. So for what it's worth, Woody Guthrie was a fan. Well, that, you know, that kind of makes sense and just the... Um... The, the I he doesn't like mythology, but sort of that archetypal, um, you know, man of the earth who you know is fighting for you know the underdog, the pure-hearted yeah. traveler, all that stuff. They all, in some sense, even though Will Rogers wasn't singing, feel like troubadours, like mm -hmm. folksy troubadours. Mm -hmm. Um, also all very poetic. I mean, that's the other thing is Will Rogers is, his work is very poetic. Um, I mean, those one-liners, uh, could be epitaphs, you know, it's like, right, right. um, we have a yeah. question actually from Fred Wistow that I think we should get to. 
Sure. Uh, I I want to ask you about Twain, yeah. of course, but would Will Rogers have seen Mark Twain speak? Was Twain an influence? And did he have a dark side? These are awesome questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great questions. You know, um, I believe Mark Twain died in about 1912 or so, if I'm not mistaken. So theoretically, um, Will Rogers could have seen him speak. Um, Mark Twain was in New York, I believe, in the in the nineteen hundred, the first decade of the nineteen hundreds, as Will Rogers was. But I never found any evidence that they had ever encountered each other, or that Rogers encountered Twain. Um, in terms of being an influence, I think uh, Will Rogers' honest modesty was such that he would never put himself in in the category of Twain, who was, you know. He was a writer and literary artist of the first rank. Um, mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I found a quote uh, when I was preparing for this conversation today. Um, Once the Hannibal Courier, Hannibal, Missouri being Mark Twain's hometown, um, uh, asked him to contribute to a special Mark Twain edition, he sent them back a telegram. Okay? And it said, me in your Mark Twain edition would be like Sister Amy being asked to the Lord's Supper. Uh, Amy was Amy Semple McPherson, who was kind of a sleazy, discredited, uh, phony evangelist. <laughs> he said, uh, there is one thing that ought to be eliminated in this country. And that is every time somebody gets a laugh of some small dimensions, why he is called the modern Mark Twain. So, you know, he did not uh, compare himself to Twain. You know, I make the comparison that he's he's less like Twain than like Huckleberry Finn, Twain's greatest mm -hmm. creation, um, speaking in a, you know, ungrammatical, but in a way profound way, uh, funny, uh, laugh with him and laugh at him and laugh alongside him. Um, uh so no, Twain was a different level of, of writer. And as to the dark side, one word answer, <laughs> no, or at least I didn't find it. Um, mm -hmm. I spent you know three years or so researching the book and I got nothing. I mean, he was, uh, we haven't mentioned his wife, Betty, but um, just a wonderful marriage. Um, uh, very happy, uh, uh, three children um, to whom he was devoted, uh, made jokes about being the only guy to go to Hollywood and not only not have three wives, but not have two and just have the one that he came in with. <laughs> um, not a tortured soul. Um, yeah, not a dark side that I could find. Maybe the next biographer will find that. Well, I want to take it back to Mark Twain um, and also some of the other sort of early Hollywood legends. Um, there's a Mark Twain prize. Mark Twain is talked about all the time. Mark mm -hmm. Twain is taught mm -hmm. in universities, of course. He's a writer. Um, but when we talk about American comedy, Mark Twain always comes up. And some of the some other folks always come up, um, mm -hmm. especially in terms of stand up. You'll never hear you know, someone talk and not mention George Carlin or Pryor, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But where's Will Rogers in this conversation and why? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, he should be he should be in it. Um, uh, I mentioned earlier uh, the extent to which he was forgotten. Um, died in 1935, suddenly in this crate plane crash. It was a state of shock nationally. I mean, people, uh, sort of like the Kennedy assassination, people would remember where they were when they heard the news. There was this plane crash in Alaska with the Aviator Wiley Post. But, you know, within five, within uh, six years, we were in World War II. Um, the atomic age would be upon us. The news about the Holocaust would have come out. And by post-war, the circumstances were just so different that Will Rogers, to those who remembered him, seemed like an antique figure. Um, 
you know, my book tried to bring him back into that conversation you talk about. And there was a Broadway show um, 20, 25 years ago called The Will Rogers Follies that was good. Uh, there was a documentary. Uh, okay, there have been several documentaries about him. So, uh, and, and with these movies coming to the public domain on YouTube and so forth, uh, you know, I, I, I hope he's, he's there and he's a part of that conversation about American humor. I think he will be. Um, uh, he's not going to dominate it. He's not the kind of person to dominate anything, self-effacing <laughs> as he was, but he, he belongs in the conversation and I think he will, he will continue to be, um, at least I hope so. Well, it's, it's funny um, when you say that he's unassuming. I don't gather that he actually would want a name, a prize named after him. <laughs> oh, God, no. Oh, he would, he would just uh, have a conniption fit, um, anything like that. Uh, he, he was allergic to uh, aggrandizement, that's for sure. Mm. Well, I'm so excited by your work. I feel like you opened the world of Will Rogers to me. And, you know, we're, we're putting the Amazon link in there. Of course, if you don't shop at Amazon, just type uh, the name of the book into your web browser and you'll find all sorts of places mm -hmm. to buy it. But what's next? Like, what can we look forward to? Oh, uh, well, um, th thank you for asking. And thank you for saying those nice things about the book. It was certainly a pleasure to do. Um, I actually, my most recent project, you mentioned my work on O. Henry, another <laughs> kind of forgotten white male figure from the past of American uh, culture, uh, was a short story writer who, when he died in 1910, I guess like Will Rogers, was the most celebrated short story writer. And this was a time when short stories were the deal. They, they were the, it was the TV of its day. Um, Aside from a couple of famous stories like Gift of the Magi and Ransom of Red Chief, he's kind of fallen out of consciousness. And I put together a anthology of 101 stories by O. Henry that just came out um, last week, as a matter of fact. Uh, the Library of America published it, which is a great um, company that puts standard high quality editions of, of major American writers. In, in print. Um, and I'm working on um, a narrative book as well about O'Henry and his years in New York City. Um, he lived in New York City from 1902 till his death in 1910. He chronicled the city in his stories, uh, the shop girls and the bums and, and sort of every stratum of society uh, at, a, at a fascinating time in the history of New York City. So I'm trying to, to capture a little of that in the, in the, in the book I'm working on right now. Well, what is it that keeps drawing you to these underappreciated <laughs> males? <laughs> no, no, no. Just like yeah. these, it's you know, it's interesting. Who these? Yeah. All these topics are kind of all over the place, but the link right. does seem to be that there's not a whole ton of work done on them. Well, well, you, you put your finger on it. That for I think for me and, and many writers. Um, writing about something that's been covered to death is is death. I mean, that's yeah. just horrible. So finding a fresh, fresh topic um, for everything I've done, that's been one of the most important um, things. You know, I since doing Will Rogers, I hadn't done any biographies um, until kind of now, this biographical work about O. Henry. So I like to write in different forms, history, that they all have in common, um, you know, uh, culture, writing, American culture, um, mm -hmm. American music. Um, those are the general things that interest me. And then I try to find uh, interesting, not too often told stories within that general field that really catches my interest. That's, that's what I'm always looking for. Oh, I'm excited about that. Everybody, we, we're dropping the O. Henry uh, 101 stories uh, in the chat. So please put that um, in your cart as well. Great. Okay, yeah. one last question. Obviously, you care for Will Rogers as a humorist. Can you name four other humorists that have like deeply affected you? <laughs> okay. Uh, boy, you didn't tell me about this one. No, um, I didn't. Well, <laughs> okay, sure. You know, I... I uh, 
I, I love humor kind of more, more than life itself. So it's an important question for me and, and it's a tough one. So uh, I apologize to anybody I, I, I don't name, um, but I put Mark Twain at the top of the list. We've already mentioned him. Um, m- moving on to uh, more, more current day, you know, I, I love Conan O'Brien. And I just watched his last his last shows. I think he is he's genius, and you know he's self effacing in his way. In his last show, he said, "What I like to do is is have comedy on the line between smart and stupid." And yeah, that's right. Uh, people that can that can traverse that line um, uh, are 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 great. Um, uh, I love the comedy of Gary Shandling. He made me laugh. Um, and then, you know, finally, a uh, name you mentioned, uh, Richard Pryor. I mean, that guy was just, um, he, he was imbued with comedy. And, you know, his, his demons and his intelligence and his anger, uh, he made it all, he put it all into the mix and uh, it, it came out, it came out genius. So uh, those are four. I'm not going to say those are the four, but those right. are those are four the uh, heroes of mine for sure. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I had a blast. I love talking about comedy, not something I know that that much about. So it's great to have uh, experts on board. Yeah, well, uh, it was my great pleasure. And uh, uh, you made it a great event with fantastic questions. So thank you. Well, first of all, I have to thank the team at the town hall who make this program possible every time we we put it on. Um, Alex, our producer, Jeff is also part of the team and really the entire town hall staff and board. We don't really do things um, without each other. So thank you to everyone at town hall. Uh, Thank you everyone at home for joining us. Um, I hope that you enjoy this program. Please come back next week. We are going to be talking about Elaine May and Elaine May and uh, the great Mike Nichols. Um, It's going to be incredible. Please come back. Uh, They had their debut, their concert hall debut at the town hall. And um, so we're going to get into what was going on then in their lives and, of course, their collaborations and then their careers outside of each other. Uh, So please come back, same time, same place to the town hall. Please sign up for our newsletter and sign up for notifications on our YouTube channel. Uh, To support the town hall and programs like these, please visit thetownhall.org backslash donate. Thank you so much for your time.